Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today we'll be addressing a question most of us have likely asked ourselves at one time or another, which is, how good is my doctor? My guest to help us discuss this important question is my friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Cuban, Senior Vice President of Cardiology for Northwell Health and the Chair of Cardiology at North Shore University Hospital and Long Island Jewish Medical Center. Dr. Cuban is also the Lorinda and Vincent de la Rey Professor of Medicine and Chair of Cardiology at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. And I can't believe I got through all those titles. <laughs> so Jeff, welcome to Well Said. Thanks, Ira. It's great to be here. So it's been my kind of informal habit since the pandemic started to start each of my interviews by asking my guests how they're doing. So how you been? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing great. I've been in New York now just over three years. Uh, our welcoming to New York was the pandemic. So yes, impeccable timing. It's, it's been great timing, but really it's been a great ride ever since. Great. So we're going to be talking about how to assess the competency of doctors. And I think that's a really important question, but I'd like to start our conversation by having you outline for our listeners how people become doctors in the first place. So just go through the training pathway that doctors have to take before they get exposed to the general public. Will do, and, and thank you again for having me on. And I think that indeed this is a really important topic to know who you're seeing when you go to the clinic, when you go to the emergency department, and is that provider, not just doctor, but is your provider competent to take care of you? So, uh, you know, the idea of going to medical school these days is a little bit different than when you and I went to medical school, but roughly it includes, after high school, four years of, of college and undergraduate degree. Uh, and these days, you don't have to necessarily study science. You can study anything you want, as long as you fulfill the requirements of medical school. Many students now, before they go to medical school, spend a couple of years getting extra training in research or other areas around the topic of medicine. And then medical school remains at uh, four years these days. Um, it's difficult to get into medical school. We have about 120 medical schools out there. Uh, very competitive these days. The landscape has uh, changed. Uh, right now, over 50% of our medical students are women, which is an, an incredible improvement and definitely a move in the right direction. After medical school, one then goes into a variety of areas within, within training, some specific or some general. And it depends on which path you take. That that determines the course as to how long you're going to be in training before you actually hang out a shingle and become a provider. Okay. And uh, so roughly speaking, four years of college, four years of medical, medical school, some amount of postgraduate medical training, and then you get a medical license from a, a state? Is that the next step before you can actually lay hands on people? <laughs> actually, your medical licensure begins as you complete medical school. Uh, you are licensed to practice medicine, but you don't really have a specialty. Then you do training and you develop your specialty, and then you develop your certification in that specialty, and then you go out and you practice medicine in your specialty. Now, during the years of training, you're taking care of patients. You're a physician with a license under the guidance of a training program, but you are able to take care of patients hands-on. Um, you mentioned something about uh, requirements of college students before they get into medical school. So are there specific things that college students need to study before they're admitted to medical school? So I think, again, the, the, it's changing a bit. I think medical schools are looking for very well-balanced physicians to be, and that incorporates liberal arts and does incorporate some science but really the ability to connect with patients, to communicate, to be professionals, to understand the, the purpose of taking care of patients at the bedside. So I think you're seeing a much different kind of medical student, a more broadly uh, broad mindset of a medical student coming into medical school these days. But there are definitely are criteria and specific requirements, including years of chemistry and calculus and physics and all the things that I long have forgotten. Yeah, well, me too. And I guess it raises the question about how important those things really are. Maybe we'll have time to, to circle back to that. But I do want to get on to the uh, assessment of competency once people pass through that whole uh, cascade that you just mentioned. But before we do that, uh, is, is that uh, sequence kind of global or is it unique to the United States? Is it different in different parts of the world? I would say it's fairly standardized. Um, in the United States, there is um, the requirement for four years of undergraduate college typically. 
In many countries abroad, uh, there is an accelerated program where you go from high school right into the medical sciences, truncated to maybe a six-year program instead of the typical eight years that we see. But then they still require some postgraduate kind of apprenticeship type training. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it also raises a question about uh, the credentials of, of doctors at that stage of their training, meaning should we care where our doctor went to medical school? I think like undergraduate, there's a certain prestige in certain medical schools or certain uh, institutions of higher learning. Um, medical school these days is pretty well standardized across the country. So I don't think there's a bad medical school out there. I think in large part, um, our medical students are being taught in a very similar fashion. There are accrediting organizations that oversee this across the country to make sure that every student who leaves with a medical degree has a certain baseline level of understanding. And there are metrics, there are tests which medical students take that need to be passed in order to get that medical degree. And would you extend that, that same sort of reasoning to uh, what I guess are called offshore medical schools? We hear a lot about American students, uh, kids who grew up in the United States, went to college here, maybe had trouble getting into an American medical school, and then went to medical school someplace else in the Caribbean, Mexico, Europe. Look, there are many medical schools across the world that are excellent, um, and I can't necessarily say ones that are outside the United States are any inferior or superior to those of the United States. I think it's important to know where your clinician has been trained and went to school, but I don't think it's the only metric out there. And uh, so, so you would extend that same sort of uh, equivalence principle, I guess, to where people did their postgraduate training. So after they graduated from medical school, it doesn't seem like it makes much difference to you whether they did that residency training at some fancy academic place that we won't name uh, or, or a lesser known institution. I think in, in, in my practice, it actually makes a little bit more of an impact as to where someone trained as to where they went to medical school. The expectation is that they went to a, a, a licensed medical school they got their appropriate training and the coursework that is necessary. They passed their requisite test testing. I think what really formulates and forms a physician is the training that they have uh, had. And I think in that respect, it does matter where they have had their training. And by training, we're talking about that first few years after medical school where people kind of differentiate into a particular kind of doctor, right? So everyone graduates from medical school with the same degree, but then they do postgraduate training to become an obstetrician or a uh, orthopedic surgeon or something else. That's correct. It's called GME, Graduate Medical Education, and that begins the day medical school ends and can last anywhere from a year to nine or ten years, depending on the pathway in which you embark. And for patients who might be curious about their own doctor's training, uh, is the information about where people went to medical school and did that postgraduate training readily accessible to people? It is. It's typically listed on the website. Uh, for example, at our institutions, if you go to our website and then to the individual physician's page and you ask a little bit further about the, the, the clinician, it will say typically where they went to medical school and where they did their postgraduate training. But it sounds like that's a voluntary uh, kind of decision that our organization made. If, if somebody is in independent private practice someplace, is that information available to people who are just curious? That's a good question. I think uh, if you look, you will find sometimes as you go into the doctor's office, you'll see diplomas <laughs> right. on the wall. That's as good as anything. Might be a little late. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, and I think it's, it is absolutely appropriate for a patient to inquire, where did my physician, where did my provider get his or her training? I think that's fair yeah. game. And sure. I think it's up to the consumer, in a sense, here, the patient, to know if it's a reputable place, if they know of it, if they know of other clinicians that have trained there. I think that does carry some weight. Yeah, and I think to your earlier point, um, it's probably easier and easier to get this information in, in the age of Yelp and Google and, and everything else. It, it, I think it's, it's probably pretty easy to come by. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what does it mean for a doctor to be board certified? And is that an important thing? So as I mentioned, after medical school, you are a licensed physician by the state in which you practice, but you're not yet board certified. You're certified by the medical school that you pass the examinations. Board certification comes after you complete a training program or a subspecialty training program. 
There are many boards out there. For example, what I practice first was internal medicine. After three years of training in internal medicine, I sat for a board certification examination by the American Board of Internal Medicine, luckily passed that. After three more years of training in cardiology, I went and sat for the cardiology certification examination, which I passed. So those are two things that are, again, on a website. You can go to the American Board of Internal Medicine and see if I am a board-certified cardiologist. So these are important. They are metrics to let the public know that the physician that they are seeing has fulfilled the requirements of training and has passed a certification examination at the completion of the training. So I know one of the issues that you've been a leader in for cardiology and by extension for medicine more broadly is this notion of uh, trying to understand the meaning of that certification and specifically a, um, a phrase uh, maintenance of certification that, that's come uh, into the fore. And could you just explain what maintenance of certification is and, and whether that's something that the public should be aware of? Absolutely. So what I just described is the initial certification process. You've completed medical school, you've now completed your training, and you've sat for the initial certification examination, which basically tests medical knowledge in the field in which you are about to go practice. And I think that's a fair um, assessment of one's medical knowledge as they move into now the, the practice. But once you become a cardiologist, you have a whole career ahead of you, maybe 20, 40 years, that you need to continue to maintain your level of understanding so you can take as best care of patients as possible. That is where we fall into the maintenance of certification process, the process of lifelong learning. And there are different ways to assess one's competence as you move 5, 10, 15, 30, or 40 years out. Think about airline pilots, right? When they finish pilot school, they don't just take one examination and then fly for the rest of their careers. They're constantly being tested and, and learning new information to keep up with the technology and keep up to make sure that the public, in this case, the flying public, is safe. And I think that cardiologists, internists, obstetricians, dermatologists need to do something similar to ensure to their patients that they are up to the task. Now, uh, I'm a little older than you, and when I sat for the internal medicine boards and cardiology boards, I got what was known as lifelong certification. Uh, and that means that I can say I'm a board-certified cardiologist for the rest of my days. Uh, it doesn't work like that anymore. Is that right? That's correct. We, we used to refer to those folks as grandparents. Yeah, well. <laughs> they were grandfathered or grandmothered into this. But actually, Ira, that's changing less than a year from now. So in January of 2024, even though you were grandfathered many years ago, if you were to look at the website come January 1st, 2024, you are no longer going to be board certified or maintaining your certification. It will say that you did pass an examination whatever years ago, but you're not maintaining your certification. And that's something new that's coming our way. And so what is it, how, how does it work now for doctors who are, you know, younger than I am, uh, who got that initial board certification and want to uh, maintain that certification as a marker of their being up to date and, and prepared to take proper care of patients? That's right. And, and by the way, maintenance of certification is telling the patient that the doctor is keeping up, but it's also telling your home institution, the insurance companies, the state, that you are also doing the, the requisite learning mm -hmm. and continuation of lifelong learning as you move forward. So right now, and that's really what we're trying to deal with in this day and age, when personally I don't think a test is the best way to assess my knowledge and how I can translate my knowledge to patients as I am now almost 30 years outside of training. But the present paradigms are every 10 years or so you sit for an examination to rehash all that education that you learned to make sure that you have a baseline level of education that can be translated into patient care. There are new ways of doing this. There are other ways that the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American College of Cardiology have collaborated to change things up a little bit. Instead of every 10 years, you take a test every year or every couple of months, a couple of questions here or there, to make sure that you're constantly engaged. The state of New York in this case and the American Board of Internal Medicine 
uh, and the American College of Cardiology also require that you have ongoing medical education. We call that continuing medical education, or CME, where you need to document that you are doing things. You're reading journal articles. You're going to uh, conferences. You're listening to webinars, and you're tracking your progress in each of the areas in which you want to keep your certification. So I want to go back a little bit to these tests that you mentioned. Uh, tell us a little bit about these tests. Are these written exams, oral exams? How does that actually work? So the traditional testing, uh, and it's not just internal medicine and cardiology, across the board are sit-down, closed-book examinations. They used to be fill-in-the-bubble tests. Yeah. Uh, now they're online. Um, to really, uh, you know, have you recall information, they're almost all uniformly um, questions and answers, you know, uh, K-type questions or um, best answer questions, typically not written out. Uh, and you get a pass-fail score. Uh, and that is supposed to help determine, do you have at least a level of knowledge that a, quote, competent physician should have? But I'm struck by the fact that a few minutes ago, you were talking about how important it is to have medical students who um, have the right attitude and, and sort of a humanistic approach to medicine. Uh, and these sound like tests of knowledge, uh, where people are filling out multiple choice questions about, I assume, you know, a disease or, or a clinical condition. Not the same thing. That's exactly, that's exactly right. And I think that's where we need to make a shift. The world has changed. By the way, no longer are students, some are, but not all students are taking the SAT or the ACT examination for this very purpose. Does a multiple choice question really give you insight into the person's ability not only to know the exact information, but be able to translate that information or communicate or work in the world at large? And I think most of us would suggest that Questions can help identify areas of knowledge or knowledge gaps, but they're not necessarily the only way that we need to use to assess individuals, in this case, your clinician. So what are some of the newer or more progressive ways to assess the things that we would actually care about knowing about our doctor? It's hard. Some of these are harder to put into, into questions than you would imagine. So how do you test professionalism, or how do you test, test empathy, or how do you test the ability to work in what we call systems-based practice? It's really difficult. I think there are ways to do it. Uh, you can do um, uh, in-person evaluations. You can actually talk to people instead of using uh, um, other types of examinations. You can ask peer of peers for evaluations. Oh, wow. Uh, you can ask uh, certain individuals who are uh, authority figures in one's practice or perhaps in an academic center to opine. There are ways to look at the quality of one's practice um, to make sure that uh, page, uh, the doctors are adhering to specific standards, whether you're putting in stents or whether you're putting in pacemakers or whether you're doing surgery. There are many metrics out there that are publicly available, by the way, that we should actually use to assess the quality of care being, put at the, being performed at the bedside. Yeah, I mean, that raises so many questions um, about the reliability of that information, whether it's universally available on every doctor in America. And, and it's also kind of a, a big project in and of itself, right? It would, it, would, it would be a major effort and expense to do that. Who foots that bill? <laughs> Uh, I'm not so sure who foots the bill right now, um, but I think that we do need to change. I think the, the concept of saying that my cardiologist is as good as he or she is because they answered 70% of the questions correct, I think... 70% of the questions correct 20 years ago. That's right. I think <laughs> that is um, short-sighted. I think we need more holistic tools to focus on what we call the non-clinical competencies, which mean not so much the hardcore medical knowledge, but the other stuff that goes into being a clinician and a physician. One needs to focus on um, how we can look at process improvement. Everyone makes mistakes, but how did you learn from that mistake and how are you going to change your practice to make it better so you don't make that mistake again? Um, I, think, I do think feedback from local environments, from national metrics, from databases that we all are participating in. You're right, it's a lot of different sources, but there are ways to actually make sure that the sources are appropriate and correct, and then putting it, putting it into some sort of portfolio that says, I am at you know whatever point in my professional career, and I'm at least 
I'm meeting, I'm meeting a specific level of competency that I can continue to take care of patients in my specialty. Yeah. You know, we've been talking about this from kind of a, um, a social or regulatory kind of perspective, but I want to shift our perspective a little bit and talk about the challenge that an individual patient may face trying to determine if the doctor whose office they're about to walk into is competent. Um, so how do you recommend that, that people approach this challenge, right? Because a lot of that information that you're talking about is not that easy to find right now. Um, and I mean, it's been true for a long time that it's probably easier to get reliable information about the car you want to buy than it is about the doctor you're about to see. So what do you recommend to patients or prospective patients about the assessment they should be doing on the doctors they may be seeing? It's a great question, Ira. And I think a lot of it comes down to personal choice. Um, I think most of us want to go into a physician's office or a clinician's office and just feel comfortable that the person is going to look us in the eye, examine us, talk to us, and give us good sage advice. I think the old school method of asking your friends and your family, who did you go to and who did you feel comfortable with and who actually did those things that I just mentioned? So I think that's, that's my first rule. Uh, did, was the person recommended by someone that you trust? Perhaps someone that was seen by that individual or someone that knows somebody who knows somebody yeah. who was seen by that individual. I do think doing some inform information gathering uh, by the patient is important. You can look up online, again, some basic things. Where did they go to school? Where did they train? Um, what kind of activities are they involved in? Um, what institution or what practice are they practicing at this point in time? And there are some publicly available evaluation tools that, again, you have to take a little bit with a grain of salt, but can be helpful. Um, Press Ganey, for example, sends out um, uh, evaluations to many clinicians' patients to get a sense as to where they are on a scale of, say, one to five. And those typically are publicly available data. Yeah, so I want to uh, pick up on that. So uh, I think what you're talking about is these uh, patient experience kinds of, of, of reviews, online patient reviews. And uh, for our listeners who may not be uh, familiar with that, it's not that dissimilar from online reviews for uh, plumbers or vacation rentals or, or restaurants. <laughs> or restaurants, right. So um, how much stock do you think we should be placing in those reviews, and be they positive or negative? Same kind of stock you put in for a restaurant or a hotel, just the same thing. If someone had a terrible experience, I think it should be noted um, in your mind, you know, wh why could that have been? Um, I wouldn't hold that as the only evaluation methodology, but it can be helpful. Uh, if that were the case in, in my mind, I would maybe want some more information, ask other people, is that consistent with, with what the feedback has been, or perhaps was that just an outlier? Yeah. We've been talking about this, I guess, in the positive sense. How do you know that somebody is good? Uh, are there warning signs that somebody is I don't want to say bad, but somebody you should not be seeing as a, as a provider. Again, I, I think it goes back to, you know, has anyone had not such a great experience? Um, have you read about the person in the newspaper? Well, or yeah, have you done in your search? <laughs> have you found things that are less if than flattering? If there's a mugshot online, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, look, it, it, physicians are people. And some, there, are, there are great physicians out there, and maybe there are some not so great physicians out there as well. And some people are more prone to mistakes than others. So I think that in this age where so much transparency is available to us, I think we as patients need to be educated consumers because we are consuming health care. And that's important for us to not only go into the examination uh, uh, evaluation um, with bright eyes and, and an open mind, but to understand who's on the other side of that table. And I think that we should go in as prepared as possible. You can't go in fully prepared, and many of the things that you might read are beyond the scope of one's typical uh, knowledge, but I think the more prepared, the better. And can you speak a little bit more about what um, organized medicine, and maybe you can speak just for cardiology, but if, if you take a broader perspective, that's great too. W what are some of the things being done to advance this notion that um, physicians have a broader responsibility to maintain their expertise, maintain their level of knowledge, uh, be, uh, share their, their data in terms of how well they're doing? 
I think most people, when they finish medical school, want to continue to learn and to practice the best possible medicine that they can throughout their careers. So I think that there is an inherent drive in physicians to maintain um, a level of competency. I just think that people can become sort of set in their ways and they may not be open or, or even avail the information may not be available to them that is important in their daily practice. Um, I think it's important for there to be a standard approach to many things. Um, I know at Northwell we provide um, standardization and quality metrics across the board for hard 300 cardiologists. So everyone is practicing basically the same type of medicine that ensures a certain level of care. Uh, and I think that's important where everyone, where, where anyone goes to get care, that there are some basic standards that are set um, to ensure that everyone can have a nuance, every provider can provide a different flavor, but the basics have to be there. You know, the other thing that comes to mind is that there's been a lot in the news recently about uh, artificial intelligence and the application of artificial intelligence to all kinds of uh, uh, issues in, in society and, and interactions and um, seems like there's a lot of potential for the use of artificial intelligence in medical encounters, making the correct diagnosis and interpreting reams of, of data and, and things like that. I, I wonder if you have some thoughts about how artificial intelligence, maybe as an example of new technology, uh, will continue to change the relationship between doctors and patients and and how our assessment of what it means to be a good doctor may need to evolve uh, because of that. You're so right. Um, AI has has and will continue to change what we do in healthcare. I like to refer to it not as artificial intelligence but augmented intelligence because I think it's a real partnership between the machine learning and the human. I don't think we're ever going to, and I hope we never, get to a point where the human is not involved because I think that part, the machine or the robot, will never be able to provide the patient the compassion, the ability to hold the patient's hand, to really feel what the patient is feeling. Um, that part should never leave the clinician's uh, purview. But I do think that augmented intelligence is going to vastly improve our ability to diagnose, not to miss things, to be sort of a check and a balance to make sure that we are doing the best we can for the patient. We can learn so much from all this vast information that is constantly flooding us right now. You know, people are wearing uh, super watches or, or technology that, that looks at every single heartbeat, every single pressure, every single this, that, and the other thing. We don't know what to do with information, but if we can synthesize it to bits of information that are based on AI and machine learning and can help the patient, I think that we can improve healthcare. We can improve improve individuals' understanding of their own habits in healthcare, and I think there's a real uh, there's a real plus to this. You know, it's so interesting to me. I, I having interviewed uh, hundreds of people as part of this show about different kinds of medical issues. Uh, it it so often comes down to the importance of that human connection between the uh, uh, clinician and, and the patient, and I, I, uh, I'm so glad you brought that up before and and just again now that um, despite the evolution of technology, that's still a a, a core competency and and a, a a key element of of good medical care. I would say now more than ever, the medical system has become so complicated. You need your provider to be your advocate. Um, and to make sure that, yes, all the check marks are complete, that you've had the testing and the data are there, but how to synthesize the data and then be your partner in the process. Yeah, and being comfortable in that relationship with the, with the physician. Uh, Jeff, this has been great. Any uh, final words you have about the issues we've been talking about? No, I think, I think this is, like I said before, this is a really important topic to know who you are seeing as a patient to have the trust in that provider, not only that they're a good listener, but that they actually are meeting the standards of what's expected for them in their specialty. And my hope is that those standards are going to change and it's going to become more about the practitioner not only knowing the exact medical jargon and knowledge, but really 
putting it all together and the ability to synthesize professionalism and augmented intelligence and all the things that we have to do as medical professionals and give it back to the patient to make sure that they're getting the best care. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Thanks very much to my guest, Dr. Jeffrey Coven, for joining me today. He is a leader in the uh, movement to change how we assess the competency of physicians. He's also a leader at Northwell Health in, in all things cardiology. Uh, thanks also to Jared Bassman for researching this topic, to our producer, Connor Pilkington, and to our audio engineer, John Mullen. For more information about this program and to find past episodes, please visit medicine.hofstra.edu slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to well said at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said.